me on that magical Twitter thing that uh, you know the kids are talking about these days. Uh, I really want to thank Katie, uh, the entire WooConf organizing team, and LCA as a whole for enabling me to be here. It's a huge honor, and I am super grateful. Let's give them a round of applause for putting on this awesome conference. <laughs> now, as Katie mentioned, um, a little bit about me. I started out as a software dev, and recently my major focus has switched to this whole DevOps thing. And as she mentioned, I even ended up starting my own company, Iara, to do DevOps consulting around about two years ago. And as a result of doing this, I've managed to come up with a few you know, ideas and opinions about what DevOps is. So what, you may reasonably ask, does Oren think DevOps is anyway? Well, according to Wikipedia, it is a culture, movement, or practice that emphasizes the collaboration and communication of both software developers and other IT professionals while automating the process of software delivery and infrastructure changes. And that pretty clearly covers it. But I think it's a lot more important than that description lets on. And it underlies the beginning of a really important shift, but one that doesn't make sense without a bit of history. So a few years ago, I was working as a programmer at Weta Digital. And at Weta, what one does as a programmer is program all the things. And indeed, I programmed all the things. Uh, specifically, I was working on a custom database engine that used a very web style of architecture and it was gonna need a fairly standard deployment handover process to make it available to the render farm. And as all software is, it was eventually done, ish, and it came time to deploy. And we do the handover. Now who's done a handover? Was it fun? No. They're generally sadness and tears. It's long, it's difficult, there's lots of back and forth, Nothing ever quite works right. And sometimes what's happened is you're using a new library or a new language version. Your program just doesn't work. And so reasonably you go to ops and you say, hey, could you support this thing? And they say, no. We're not installing that. It's not supported yet. And your release gets kicked back a week, a month, while you retool on what they are willing to support. And again, this is sadness and tears, and this isn't fun. And a lot of this is hard because there's a big split between ops and dev, which is a fairly common pattern that you may have seen, especially if you worked at places with larger IT departments. And one of the reasons this split happens is different priorities. On the one hand, ops cares a lot about not getting yelled at for things being broken or offline. If their stuff is broken, at three in the morning, the business is losing money. On the other hand, devs care a lot about not getting yelled at for not shipping product fast enough. If they're not able to add features quickly, the business will start bleeding customers. The end result of this is one of two failure modes. Either ops wins and says no to everything, and the devs are sadness and tears, or the devs win and ship things that ops doesn't know how to fix at 3 a.m and ops is sadness and tears. So, coming back to Weta, this is where I was introduced to DevOps. I went to handoff, and the sysadmin team, you know, they, and they said, hey, could you please just write a puppet manifest? And I said, puppet, what's that? <laughs> this was an entirely new way of reasoning about my program, not by itself, but as part of a constellation of pieces, thinking about the system as a whole, it was wonderful. I could test my entire system without bothering ops for a test server, because I had VMs. I could test on exactly what they were willing to support in production. I could throw away my VM and trivially rebuild it when I broke it, because developers, we break things, right? I could build more robust systems. I was communicating more building bridges with other teams, starting to work to, towards creating that culture of collaboration. I was helping by reducing their stress and frustration. And our definition earlier covered communication and collaboration. And DevOps was showing me that it's about helping people. That, you know, as a dev, I got these shiny new tools that I got to play with. That was beside the primary thing that I could help others. And that's become my job, talking, working with users who are devs and ops people, 
finding out what their needs are, finding out what their pain points are, asking what they do versus what they want, helping them see the steps towards what it is they actually want to do, helping them find out where they want to be at all, supporting them along that journey. And I realized that what I'm doing is providing great experiences for my users. I work to improve their lives, make their, commu make their communication better, and their jobs easier. And even though my users are technical, this is still highly important. And once I figured that out, I started doing more research on UX, learning about things like design thinking. This is new ways of approaching problem solving, doing research at all. This is great. But remember when I said that DevOps is a culture of collaboration? One of the key things that learning DevOps started to show me is that the underlying developer culture gets in the way of DevOps practices. But what do I mean by that? Well, what I started to notice is our culture very strongly reflects an attitude of dominion, of being better than other people. And there's some historic reasons for why this is. See, when I was a kid, I was bullied a lot, and I was not very happy. I didn't like school, and I felt like I wasn't in control most of the time. So I ended up turning to computers and playing a lot of video games. You know, stuff like Civilization or SimCity or Populous, and you can probably see the theme. <laughs> but these were games where I felt like I was in control, like I could affect things, like I had power that I didn't have in the rest of my life. And a lot of people I've met over the years have very similar origin stories. We got into computers to have something where we felt like we were in control. And we stayed because we felt like we had power. And that thing about feeling like you have power means you want to keep feeling like that. And not having power elsewhere means you don't want others to take it from you. So we tried very hard to make it exclusive. And you can see this in our words. Terms like deep magic or black magic was being used in early programming. There's an anecdote that reminds me of where early on, a developer had left the comment, you are not expected to understand this in his code. So we ended up with practitioners of these inscrutable arts being called wizards. They held real power over these, over these things that made us feel powerful. And our language tells us to look up to them in awe. So our means of retaining exclusivity of our power were to position ourselves as better than you, creating an hierarchy of class where wizards are the elite, jealously hoarding their knowledge. Magic is ineffable. Only the chosen ones, you know, like us, can appreciate it or understand it. And even today, we want this status. We just call it different things. Wizards are now rock stars or ninjas or my personal favorite, the 10X engineer. These are terms meant to show that we are still better than you, that we are more worthy, that we are more exclusive, a higher standard. And a part of the ops dev split I mentioned earlier is driven by this. Developer culture encourages us to look down upon ops people because they don't write code. They are not, unlike us, masters of the arcane. We see this strongly reinforced by Silicon Valley startup culture, where engineers are the most important part of the company. So what do you get when you have an entire culture founded on more knowledge makes a better person and using that to demonstrate that you are better than other people? You get what I call contempt culture. And you may have heard me talk about this before. Uh, this is the idea that we accrue status in our communities through displays of contemptuousness towards things and people that we see as beneath us. We do this by positioning ourselves as knowing more, as having more refined taste. You may have even seen this in action with stuff like, you used that language? Ew, why didn't you use something else? And this is meant to make you feel small, that the speaker knows more than you, that your achievements are worthless. How about, I've been programming since I was four. 
to say that if you picked up programming recently or came from other backgrounds, you were lesser. Again, you were meant to feel small. Like there is nothing that you can contribute that is of any actual value. After all, you should have been studying programming from the very start, even if you couldn't have afforded a computer because you were four. How about your OS sucks? Ew, why do you use it? Again, you're meant to feel small, ignorant, that the speaker is so much better than you. And then there is the perennial favorite of, <laughs> ew, you use that text editor? By doing this, we are demonstrating our status to the rest of our group, that we hold the right knowledge, that we know more than those that we see as beneath us, and that we are reinforcing that what our group has decided is correct. And we're encouraged to do this, to show off that we have enough status to not be called on being a jerk, that we are the elite of the elite. New, as a newcomer, I saw people behaving this way. I saw that it was okay. I saw that it was powerful. Trashing other languages, calling other OS users ignorant. And I wanted that status. I wanted to show I belonged in the group. And so I started doing it too. But if everyone does this, what you end up with isn't a fun place to be. You get a community of that guy. So what do I mean by that guy? Well, when status means more knowledge is better and I can get away with being a jerk, you end up with a culture dominated by people who do not get called out on being a jerk because they have great technical knowledge and it would be a loss to not have access to that. This makes me think of a thing that happened in Canada in the 1800s. So the Banff Springs Hotel was being built in the Rocky Mountains. And this is a beautiful luxury hotel situated on the Can Canadian Pacific Rail Railway line that crosses Canada. Um, and they picked the spot for this amazing view down the Bow River Valley. They called it the Million Dollar View. Um, that's a postcard from the, Bo um, the Banff Springs Hotel. And they said, if you can't bring the view to the tourists, bring the tourists to the view. So construction started, everything was going to plan until the owner of the railroad showed up and noticed that his hotel was being built backwards. And that million dollar view was going to the kitchen staff. Oops. And the story I heard was that the architect drew up the plans and sent them out to his assistants without a compass marked to indicate what direction the building should face. So the assistants made a call, marked a compass, sent the plans out, and the building ended up facing up the mountain instead. And the story I heard was that the architect was that guy. He was known for blowing up at his staff over things that he thought were trivial, were simple, were obvious. And no one wants to get yelled at, so they took the sensible route, marked a compass themselves, and out it went. But if his staff were too afraid to ask for this, what else might have gotten missed? Unfortunately, I think the story about the architect being hostile might be apocryphal. I'm chasing down the citation and I've almost got it, but I don't have it yet. Maybe it was that the plan showed up on site and the foreman noticed there wasn't a compass and had to make a call. In the 1800s in Canada, it was a week or more to send something back to get this fixed. And construction schedules, people on site, cost a lot of money. Uh, that guy was involved somewhere though. Someone decided it was better to make a call than ask. We all know a that guy. We've all worked with them. I certainly have. You may even be working with them right now. And we've all gone, huh, I could go ask them about this thing I'm struggling with you know, and take advantage of that great technical knowledge. Or, and this is critical, I could not. <laughs> and enjoy that overwhelming sense of relief that I don't have to subject myself to that. 
Up until very recently, I was that guy. I would trash other languages because they weren't as good as the one I was using. I made snide comments about what OS people were using. Accepting that I was causing people to feel bad was really, really hard. That for years, I was the reason that people didn't want to stay in tech or left. That I had worked to create the culture of contempt. And it struck me recently just how easy it was to learn to behave this way. We want to belong, and our communities show us that this is how we belong. And how hard that makes it to unlearn, to push against it just within myself. And now that my job is helping people, how much that attitude gets in the way of being able to help, of being able to understand their problems. And I think about all the times I couldn't get the help I needed because the only people I could ask were that guy. Because I'd be so anxious of being made to feel small and awful and ignorant that I didn't know something that I just wouldn't ask. And this wrecks team dynamics. People don't want to come to work. They become anxious. They disengage. That guy goes unchallenged. People drift away from our communities. But they have great technical knowledge. And it would be a loss to not have access to that. But it's already lost. Because we choose not to engage. We prefer not to engage. To not subject ourselves to that hostility and contempt. This doesn't just affect teams. This gets in the way of our outreach. Not through I am better than you attitudes directed at attendees of programs um, like Rails Girls, but when so many of them are coming in with Windows laptops and our tools reflect our contempt, are difficult to use on Windows, they are hostile, the documentation is poor and out of date because our communities are filled with that guy and for so long, community response has been, that OS sucks. Ew. No one should use it. And so we refuse patches. And we mock those who try to help. And the people who thought things could be better than this eventually stopped fighting and just drifted away. Unlearning my behavior has been very hard. It took learning to actually listen to people, not waiting to pounce on how they are wrong. It took learning to be excited for their achievements, no matter how small they were. To support what they were doing, not just technically, but emotionally. Because it didn't matter if I thought they were using the wrong tool. What mattered was their goal, finding ways to help them reach that goal. Offering my knowledge to help, not to reinforce that I was better than them. My worldview shifted from demonstrating my superiority to asking how I could be of service. To where my goal is to enable their goals, be it in helping build roadmaps to where they want to go, helping develop a DevOps culture, and just building tools to help them do their things. And enabling users means caring about their experience, caring about their goals, whether or not they achieved their goal at all. And in professional software development, this is where Agile comes in, right? Because we have user stories and iteration and getting things in front of customers in order to fail fast. And this does help, particularly when we tie it to good user experience principles and asking real users good questions. Unfortunately, it's very easy to take shortcuts in these processes. Sometimes because it's a business, time and money get in the way. But more importantly, because dominion-centric thinking gets in the way. It gives us permission to take those shortcuts. And our cultures are structured so that we won't get called on it. Because of three simple words that underpin everything that we do. I no, enough. We do this all the time. We hear about problems and we think, 
how do I solve this with technology? But in doing so, we disregard the nuance and the context. When we disregard nuance, we jump to conclusions. We act as though our knowledge is authoritative, all because we can code. It's been around for so long that there's a name for it, engineer's disease. And, you know, someone on Twitter attributed a quote to Socrates describing it. And since it was on Twitter, we all know it must be true. <laughs> and I can describe how it works. But what does it look like when we live in that sort of environment? What are some examples? Well, a major one I can think of is Apple Health. Now, this debuted with iOS 8, and it came out with some great stuff around tra tracking step counts automatically and a bunch of good self-tracked stuff, you know, like weight or diabetic blood tracking or your sleep or so other self-tracked stuff like how I'm completely failing to track my own caffeine intake. But there was one major oversight in the self-tracked items, and there was a big blow-up about it which is anything around reproductive health, which is, as you may know, important to rather a lot of women. The result of which being that Apple overlooked the needs of over three billion people. How did this happen? We don't need to think outside of our group. We don't need to do any research. We know enough already. How about virtual reality? Currently shipping virtual reality gear makes a lot of women nauseous just by putting it on. The current hypothesis is that women and men use very different tracking uh, cues for depth. So why didn't this get noticed earlier? You know, before we started to ship consumer kits that people could buy. We don't need to think outside of our group. We don't need to do any research. We know enough already. And our culture recent reinforces treating ourselves as the only ones that matter. In 2009, HP shipped some media center software that refused to recognize the presence of black faces. At WDCNZ in 2015 and PyCon AU in 2015, Karina Zona talked about Google's automated image tagging failing dramatically on photos that included black people. Again, why did this happen? We don't need to think outside of our group. We don't need to do any research. We know enough already. And our culture gives us permission. So what do we do about this? And this is where the service-centric worldview becomes very important. Let's look at an example of people reorienting to a service-centric worldview. Uh, at KiwiCon three-ish years ago, a manager from Etsy gave a talk about dismantling contempt culture around the InfoSec team within Etsy. Um, and like most IT teams, it was off in the corner in the dark, and they were very standoffish. They said no a lot. So what they did was, the, the manager of engineering moved the InfoSec team out of the corner into the middle of the office, the physical middle, so that everyone had to walk by the InfoSec team as they crossed the office. They set up a hiring policy that they would no longer p hire people that looked like that guy during the interview because they knew they wrecked any culture of collaboration. And they put out a bowl of lollies by the InfoSec desks, you know, on a scale, as you do. And they were able to correlate that the more lollies had been taken, the less weight was on the scale, the fewer security incidents they were seeing. And so they reasoned that other teams are stopping for candy, but staying to have a chat. And because the InfoSec team was reorienting to service and not Dominion, they were being heard and listened to. Etsy gave the other teams a better experience interacting with InfoSec, and they saw real benefits in doing so. So how do we follow in Etsy's example? How do we dismantle our own Dominion-centric cultures? We ask more questions. Questions like, who are we missing? 
Why did we miss them? How are we making them afraid to interact with us at all? These are questions that Apple, Google, and HP certainly asked very loudly after the backlash. How could this happen? Aren't we good at what we do? Aren't we? This is a hard question to ask of ourselves. I started, and I started to see a coerced performance of contempt culture. I started to see how we suppress asking, suppress looking for knowledge outside of ourselves. That we built a culture where, not, where we give ourselves permission to not know by coupling our status to how few questions we ask and how this forces ourselves into willful ignorance. This is a culture that drives imposter syndrome. It demands that we pretend to know everything with fear of exposure as a fraud always hanging over us because asking becomes terrifying. It admits we don't know. It gives up status. So aren't we good at what we do? No, we're not because we know enough already. By shaming questions, we deny ourselves the tools of introspection and claim this as a strength. To introspect is, in contempt culture, to be less deserving of status, to belong less. So we make assumptions. And because we make those assumptions, we overlook people. Apple overlooked people. HP overlooked people. Google overlooked people. Because dominion-centric thinking gives us permission to overlook people. And that itself becomes a part of our mastery, a part of our imposter syndrome, a part of the display of our status. I don't need to listen to you. I know enough already. And then we miss over three billion people. I told myself I didn't do these things, that I haven't done this, that I wasn't responsible. But I was, and I had to own that, to accept that I had done these things that I am not proud of, and accept that I had shown contempt towards other skills, other backgrounds, other bases of knowledge. And I'd like to share a story about one particular time that I did this. And this was in Calgary. This was about eight years ago now. And I was at a meetup. And if you've ever been to a meetup, you know that before the presentations, there's usually a call for jobs. And no, this was a big meetup, two, maybe 300 people there in a multi-story bar with a big open cavernous space. And I was sitting at the bottom. And someone stood up to say, hey, we're looking for .NET developers. And I called out into the silence and the darkness, get a real language. I still cringe when I think about this. But I hadn't thought about it for years until I started thinking about contempt culture, at what I do and why. I'm horrified by that moment in my past, horrified that I did that but more horrified that I thought that was okay. But I still did it. And now I know that it hurt people, hurt through my unfounded assumptions, my refusal to ask questions, because I knew enough already. And as a result of my actions, people drifted away. So what do we do about it? we make sure to challenge the assumptions that we make, to challenge those who say we do not need to challenge our assumptions. We ask if we are thinking about accessibility, or women, or other bodies, or other cultures, or other languages. And these are hard questions to ask of ourselves. They require that we admit that we do not know everything, but that we acted like we did that we did overlook people, we did exclude them. And these questions make us feel like we are bad people for acting this way. 
It challenges that we are good at what we do. It challenges our very sense of belonging. But asking is critical. We can't improve if we don't ask. And we can't help if we refuse to improve. So how do we ask these questions at all? I keep coming back to user experience. User experience can teach us techniques for formulating questions, for doing better research, for finding people to ask, for asking the right way. So ask the user experience people you know. Read the user experience materials. Understand what makes good experiences possible. And there's a user experience expert in the audience today. She has blue hair. Maybe come up to her and ask a little bit. Get some reference material. Do research. Perform inclusive hiring. Find people who are not like you, who do different things. Because diverse teams ask more questions, which build better products that give more users better experiences. The startup in Wellington is fostering a culture where the tech team is allowed to veto hiring decisions. And they told me a story about a recent interview where they pushed back on a candidate who'd given warning signs during the interview, specifically ignoring the women developers and generally being condescending to them. It made those developers uncomfortable, and they had been encouraged to speak out about it. So they pushed back, and the hire wasn't made. They were listened to. So what is human-driven development? It's the integration of all of these ideas. It's unlearning contempt culture, relearning a new way of approaching our development culture at all. It's engineering with a focus on our users, because our users aren't just ourselves. They're everyone. By asking the questions that we do not ask, the questions that are hard, asking what our assumptions are, admitting that we don't know, that always knowing is not status, by not allowing that guy to dominate our conversations. And you might ask why I think this is so critical. It is because we are currently defining the future. We are building what later generations will build upon. Everything is a computer, or will be. The phone that you carry now, the fridge that will know when it's empty, the Pokemon that we have spent six months catching, because contempt is hostility, written into decades of our code, all the data sets that we are building. It is the foundation that too many of us insist we, be, we continue to build upon. And when we stay silent on hostility and contempt, we become complicit in it. And hostility is treated as damage. None of you want to have to deal with that guy. But in a dominion-centric world, we are that guy to someone else. And like the internet treats censorship, damage will be routed around. And being routed around means our inevitable disruption. To be excised, as we excise that guy already. And not only that, we already are being disrupted. We see this in the rise of codes of conduct and the contributor covenant. These are tools that are explicit acknowledgments that people were overlooked and excluded, and that we must work to explicitly welcome them. We are removing bad apples from our communities, acknowledging that we overlooked the harm they spent years perpetuating. We have uh, the Inspiral Dev Academy in Wellington, which is a coding boot camp. And they promote teamwork and empathy as first-order principles of engineering. We see it in Etsy, re-envisioning their internal culture. And I'd like to read a quote now. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. By holding fast to our dominion-centric cultures, we refuse to unlearn our behavior and reinforce our own illiteracy and irrelevance. We push ourselves further and further away. But we can fight our illiteracy 
by building bridges, by talking, by working to understand, by communication and introspection, by always remembering that we don't know enough and reforming our communities that ignorance and status and denial are not status and must not be treated as such. And if you remember that definition of DevOps from the very start, that is what DevOps is. Building bridges, talking, communication, introspection, forming a culture of service, paving the way for a fundamental shift in how we approach all of software development by asking who we missed because you are missing people right now by asking how we help because helping people is what we're here for that is human driven development the shift from dominion to service away from contempt and hostility towards helping others towards a core value not of being better than others, but of how well we enable our users. Because our users are everything, and without whom we are nothing. And by working together, we can build a better world, not just for you and for me, but for everyone. Thank you. No, I'm not muted. Exactly. I can do a bit of a yes. dance. No, th this needs to boot. It's really weird. But yes, thank you for that. That was wonderful. And more clap. So we've got a couple of minutes break while we change around.